Now, today's sermon is what giving does for you. Now, I don't know about you, but some pastors probably get really nervous when they know they're preaching about money. But you know, this sermon, I'm not nervous at all. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Because honest, the more I think about it, the more joy I get. And we're going to go to Philippians chapter 4, if you have your Bible. Philippians chapter 4. Now, I don't know if you know much about the Philippians. I know it sounds like Philippines, but it's not. The, Philipp the Philippians, uh, they were probably one of the most charitable churches. They were probably the most quick to rise up and send a cash offering to Brother Paul, wherever Brother Paul is, to help support his ministry. In fact, he's writing to Philippians from prison just after having received another gift to continue his ministry, <laughs> even though he's in prison. He was a busy person even in prison. He you know, didn't know it, but he was writing scripture and inspiring people and, and managing things from prison. Philippians chapter four, we'll start in verse 11. And he just, he just said, thank you for the gift. He says, not that I, res I speak in respect of want, like I'm not desperately needy, for I have learned in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. He says, I'm not needy and I'm not greedy because I've learned in whatever, whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know how to be abased, how to be humble, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. He says, I'm cool with that. This is okay. I know that we have the vicissitudes of life. Sometimes I'm, I'm better off financially. Sometimes I'm looking for my next meal. But I have a shepherd. And I know that my shepherd's going to take care of me. He says, I know how to abound and I know how to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's where that verse comes from. He was just talking about, thank you for the gift, and I, I can survive, and thank you for it. He says, notwithstanding, you have done well that you did communicate with my affliction. Amen. That communicate with my affliction means giving a gift. Now, ye Philippians know, going to our next page here, although I don't have all these verses on the screen for you, I'm going to read verse 15. Now, ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving. He says, I was planting churches and planting churches, but they weren't really giving any appreciation to help support me to reach more churches. They were taking, but they weren't giving. But you only, you guys remembered me. You guys understood the power of, of paying it forward, of being appreciative. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity, twice. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that ye may abound to your account. He says, I know that when you guys are giving, you're being mature. You're identifying with the ministry. You're supporting with me. In fact, you're laboring with me when you support me with your finances. And I rejoice because I know that you guys, of all the churches I've planted, you guys are going to have some abundant fruit when you get to heaven. There's going to be souls in heaven because you guys gave. He says, I don't desire a gift, but I desire fruit that ye may abound to your account. But I have all and I abound. I am full having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell. You know, that's what a sacrificial offering was in the Old Testament. And God's nose, it was an odor of sweet smell. And that's what he's calling this little financial gift to help him with his ministry. A sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And here's where another incredible verse comes from. He says, you know what? But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And then we love that verse, don't we? That verse was written to a church that was a giving church. Amen. I want to be a pastor of a giving church. I've been in many churches that were giving churches. And I was proud to know that our church was supporting so many missionaries. In fact, we used to have a prayer room. We'd go into the prayer room. And whenever we would have a missionary that we would support, 25 to 50 bucks a month, we'd put a plaque up on the prayer room wall. Maybe a family would support them. And we'd put the plaque up there with the person's photo, name, and country. And so people who go to the prayer room can pray for the missionaries that we're supporting. And that room got full. 
And I thought, man, this is incredible. We are doing it. We are doing the work. We are not just trying to build a the little club here, but we are reaching out and we are ministering and we are sharing the gospel without even going. Now, Paul's epistle to the Philippians is called the epistle of joy. He wrote from prison, last place you'd expect joy, to thank them for their generous offering. The repeated sacrificial gifts enabled him to continue his ministry. You know, we know that Paul worked, you know, he was a tent maker, but he did that probably when things got a little tight, when he had to actually work. And of course, when he's working, he's not sharing the gospel as much as if he was going to the market and sharing the gospel or visiting people's homes and visiting, sharing the gospel. So their finances empowered Paul's evangelism to spread the gospel. Now, Paul said, I don't necessarily need your money, but I want to see your fruitfulness. You know, they both help. They're both good. The Philippians discovered the truth of Jesus who said in Acts, he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I want to remind you today of the opportunities that are available for giving. Not only are there ministries to equip, but we share in the reward as well as the victory. Amen. Jesus said, if you so much as give a cup of water to a prophet in my name, you're going to share in his reward. If we support missionaries, home missionaries and foreign missionaries, we're, we're enabling them to continue their ministry. And we're going to share in God's reward to those who labored for those victories. We can financially battle the devil in many areas of this world through strategic giving strategic giving and i hope that you're strategic with your giving sometimes i might get something in the mail and they say we got a, we got a, a need that needs to be met and i'm thinking oh but you know i already strategically give to some good causes in the church and not just my church but the church and abroad we can extend our impact through supporting ministries that can do what we can't do and that can go where we can't go. So let's all pray that God would give us generous hearts to discover the joy of giving like the Philippian church. We have another weapon in our bat belt for battling the devil and saving lost men and, and women across the world. Amen. And that's through giving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord God, that we'll see the joy of giving help us to be strategic lord god hallelujah help us to understand that that this is something that you want mature christians to do and i pray that we'll all desire to be mature christians lord god help us to rise up and identify with the cause identify with the gospel and help us lord jesus to do that lord jesus by by just following the simple instructions you've given on tithes and offerings in this New Testament age. In Jesus' name we pray. We also pray a special blessing upon the Hernandez family, Lord, the children. Lord, give them strength and give them health, Lord Jesus. Bless them. And we also pray again, Lord God, for power and continued growth in the Newcastle Church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All righty. So, first, we've already discovered that giving generously gives us the privilege to enter into partnership with God's servants around the world. This can be in the form of home missions and foreign missions giving. We also have people in church who support the orphanage in Mizoram, Mizoram, India. Amen. We can't go to the orphanage. I've never been there, but we've had many people in Australia, Pentecost, go and they've laid cement and they've done work. Sometimes the guys will go and do work on the orphanage and then they'll come back home and then we uh, we'll sponsor them. They have about 30 or 60 children as, as things fluctuate, but they know how to worship. Amen. And they're, and they're raising them well. Amen. Um, we can also give to the National Youth Ministry or to the National Sunday School Department so they can equip us with resources to develop national programs like AYM and, um, and Sunday School Ministries at General Conference where kids come home from conference and they got the Holy Ghost, you know. How incredible is that? But they can only do that if they've been saving money up through the year and um, and then bringing people over from America who are skilled at ministering. Now, whenever I run into some small churches, you know, they might be our size. They might be a little smaller. They might be a little bit bigger. I say, yeah, well, what denomination are you? And they say, oh, we're not. We're non-denominational. 
And they somehow, maybe, they think that makes them more biblical, not having a denomination. Oh, we don't like denominations. We believe in just being Bible Christians. But I tell you what, being non-denominational really cripples your ability to extend beyond this building. Because if you don't have a denomination, you don't have foreign missionaries to support because you got nothing unless you're going to send someone personally. You've got no home missionaries to support. You probably don't even know an orphanage. You know, many times they're just crippled. They are just cut off because they've got no leadership to hold them accountable. They've got no leadership to help them. They've got no way to extend themselves. So, amen. I am glad to be a part of the United Pentecostal Church. Amen. I really am. So we have incredible leadership. I've got Brother Paul Hickler as my presbyter, our presbyter. Amen. We've got leaders to equip us. We got one of our rural national heritage items is Brother David Kent. Amen. He is something else. He keeps his, his, his ear to the legal heartbeat to help us know what we need to do so we don't get in trouble. Because there's just so many things to do as pastors to keep churches legal that, and they keep changing the rules, and they always have very big penalties for not doing them. So Brother David Kent helps us to stay on top of that. Amen. And you can't get that if you're just an independent church doing your own thing. And you think you're being biblical by just doing it your way, but really you're just doing your own thing. And that's it. Amen. We actually have an impact bigger than this building, and I'm grateful for that. Amen. Amen. Secondly, after being privileged to enter into partnership with God's servants around the world, secondly, we can give generously to put us in a position to receive the blessings promised to tithers. And we'll go to Malachi chapter 3. This is usually where most pastors start. Now, God was mad at Israel. The temple was in ruins. Everyone was just doing their own thing, worrying about themselves. And God said, this is not right. My priests have, have to scatter and they have to get jobs because my people aren't taking care of them. And if they're not, if they're working jobs, they're not doing the sacrifices that are necessary. In verse eight of Malachi chapter three, he says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? He said, in your tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven to pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God is, is, is upset with people who don't pay their tithe. And he is eager to bless those who do. He says, if you do, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And the nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, if you are a Christian and you receive an income, the Lord wants you to pay a tithe on the profit to support the work of God. Now, a tithe is not a number that you can choose. It's 10%. So you take your paycheck or you take your profits and you say, okay, here's my profits, which if you're a sole proprietor, doesn't mean everything you collect. It just means the profits. 10% of that belongs to the Lord. And he uses the word pay. Okay. It was his to begin with, but he wants us to pay. He gives it to us. He trusts us with that. And he wants us to pay it back to under, to show his, his ownership. He's very concerned about his portion. The city of Jericho was God's tithe. God said, don't touch it. Anything here that you find goes to the temple. Everything else we're just going to leave and let it rot. This is my tithe. But someone took from the tithe. Someone took from Jericho. And it had terrible consequences for the nation and for his family. When you support the church, you're helping to pay rent and buy musical equipment so we can have church services for free to all visitors. Amen. You get to take charge. You get to sit there and say, you know what? I had a help make this happen. You know, just the simple ties that God asked me to give. I gave it. And now we have this happening and we can have visitors come and they can just come free of charge. No guilt, no, no obligation to give. They can just come and enjoy. I would like to say air conditioning. We'll get there one day. <laughs> but we have the, the music and the worship singers using good equipment. Amen. 
And, um, and it's a blessing to be able to be part of the giving in that. Musicians can play, singers can sing to escort people into the presence of God to prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. You can also pay for the technology. We got some pretty powerful computer over there and we have a camera and we have these iPads. We're sending the message out on the internet for free. Okay, we have to buy the technology to do it for free. And we have um, the World Wide Web. We've got our websites where people can find out about us. You never know who's gonna hear the gospel from one of our services or from our internet. Now, there was a, a Muslim man right here in New South Wales who became a Christian. He didn't like the Trinity and he wanted to be baptized in the name of Jesus. He visited many churches and was disappointed. He stumbled onto the NBPC website and read our statement of beliefs. He liked how I described the oneness of God and he found a church near him because he doesn't live near us. And he and his family now attend a UPCA church. Amen in New South Wales. He, his wife and his two children have all been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. One of his boys said, this is the best day of my life when he got baptized. So if you tithe, you help to do that because websites cost about $250 a year to keep online. You have to pay hosting and you have to pay this and to have the name. And so again, it, since this world works on money, when you participate by giving money, you partake in the things that we purchase in order to be a part of the services we provide. Amen. Tithing allows God to open the windows of heaven, like he said. He said, you'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be enough room to receive it. Now, warning, you're not going to get a call from Commonwealth Bank saying, listen, this is too much. OK, <laughs> our computers can't handle numbers this big. You're not, that's not what he means. OK, it means, though, that you're going to be getting blessings in all kinds of areas of your life. Amen. Not just in finances. Sometimes you might hear people say, give and it'll be given back to you exactly like you gave and with the queen's face on it, you know, but we're not going to make that kind of a guarantee. The Lord doesn't. But I believe he means it's going to be overflowing blessings. And I've enjoyed that myself. I really have. Tithing allows God to rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Things won't fall apart so quickly or wear out so quickly or simply disappear. We are much better off with 90% of our income with God's blessing on it than keeping 100% of our income with God's curse on it. Amen. Now, as a pastor, I got to share that with you. Okay. Just like we have to tell people that they've sinned and they need to get saved. You know, we got to let you know that if you do, if you don't tithe, that, that your money is going to have a curse on it. If, you, if you're a Christian, amen. If you've been baptized in Jesus, amen, spirit filled, your property of Jesus Christ. And he, he wants you to do that. Amen. I have to pass that on to you. However, one of the biggest blessings of tithing is knowing that you're helping us to have church every Sunday with nice equipment. Amen. You're not taking your giving. Amen. And every mature Christian who tithes helps the church to be healthy because again, healthy Christians make a healthy church. Amen. So thirdly, giving generously makes it possible for us to have treasure in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said in verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. They say, if you want to know what's important to someone, just look at their bank statement. Follow the money. Where's the money going? And I remember one time I had a checkbook when I was a young Christian. And at the beginning of the checkbook, I was buying rock music and comic books on, on, on the, on, through the mail. And just, you know, simple worldly things. And then it starts, I start spending more money at the Christian bookstore. And I should have held on to it. Because it's kind of like you can look at my checkbook and say, you know what? Something happened to this boy. Something changed because <laughs> his money started going from one place to another place. His heart had gone from one place to another place because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen. A big bank had a clock on the wall with the words time to save. 
and knew that those who saved often would accumulate wealth to empower them in their later years. Empower them. It was good for the bank and it was good for them. Time to save. This is earthly treasure. And it does have its due power. It's got power. But the person who gives generously to the work of God throughout the years is accumulating spiritual treasures in heaven. You don't need to sell your house and give away the money. Just make regular deposits where your heart is. Do you love the church? Do you love missionaries? Do you love orphans? Where is your heart? Where's your passion? Support it. I mean, team up with these people. Let your heart be manifested. I started tithing even before I began going to church. I just knew that God wanted me to give. I just didn't know how or where. I was giving the Muscular Dystrophy Association and I had a Christian. I was asking him questions about tithing. I think he thought that I was persecuting him about money. You know, people always have this sort of churches and money, you know, animosity. Oh yeah, I mean, I had one guy who said, yeah, your pastor just takes the big bag of money and goes home trying to get me stirred up, you know? Because that's, you know, that's how the world sometimes view the church. But I knew I had to give somewhere. I was asking him about tithing, and I think he was getting upset. He, I think he thought that I was attacking him, but I was curious. And in due time, he finally got the hint that I was hungry, and he invited me to church, and it's been uphill ever since. It's been so good. Amen. But I started attending church and started tithing there. And then I started setting extra money aside. I'm not ruining my treasures by talking about this, I believe. I think it's be an inspiration here. I, I started setting extra money aside for just emergencies. If I knew someone who needed some money, I'd give them some money. If I saw a single mom was low on money, I'd give her money. If, uh, if a missionary came to town, I'd give them money. You know, I'd have some extra money set off to the side. We call that offerings. Anything on top of a tithe is an offering. And I just learned early, and I thank God I learned early, to be generous. Because it's possible to, to overvalue money and then money becomes your boss and you don't even know it. Amen. So, I joined the army and I began supporting a missionary to Micronesia, Brother Donald Patridge and his family. And then after I quit the army, they came to my church and I got to say, hey, listen, I've supported you for three years. So nice to meet you, you know, and, and I'm... I'm going to receive a part of the reward for the souls they won in Micronesia, which happens to be Palau is in Micronesia. And, um, and so, I, you know, I'm sure God's going to take care of that one day and it'll be an exciting time when I find out what my money was able to accomplish. Amen. I love missions. I love the church. I love knowing my tithes and offerings have resulted in people going to heaven. You might say, but I'm not that skilled at, at, at winning people or teaching home Bible studies. But if you give it to the church where well, they can do it, you're going to share in the reward. And people making it to heaven, that is the best reward. That is the best reward. Amen. That's the kind of treasure thieves can't steal and rust can't rot and moths can't destroy. You know, we can buy some nice stuff here. But, you know, that TV is going to wear out eventually. That car. That sizzling, sparkly car. I mean, I had a friend who won a car on Wheel of Fortune. Wouldn't you think that would change your life forever? Cars are expensive. Three years later, I said, hey, how's your car? Man, it wore out. <laughs> I thought, you know, you think that would change a person's life, winning a car on Wheel of Fortune. These things wear out. Everything wears out. Everything you buy, every razzle-dazzle, blingy thing that, that you fill in your house, you think, if I just had this, it'll make me happy. It all wears out. But getting souls into the kingdom in some other nation or in some other city, amen, that's a keeper, amen. That's a keeper. We, when they get in there, when, when they get one to the Lord, amen, it's something that you can't buy. It's better than anything you can possibly buy. You'd be so glad you put your money there rather than into stuff in the house. Number four, giving generously strengthens your relationship with the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, for those of you who are quick, but this I say, he which sows or plants sparingly shall reap sparingly. If you plant five or six seeds, you're going to be hungry. You got to plant thousands of seeds if you're going to feed your family. 
And he which sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according to his, as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So again, it's not my mission to bully you into it. Paul said, I'm not going to bully you into it. I'm, I want you to see how exciting this is with me. I want you to join with me. You know, you have power. When, 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 when money ends up in your hand and you know that you can afford to, to invest it somewhere, invest it in the kingdom because we're fighting the devil and we're actually getting people in the home base. Amen. He said, I don't want you to be miserable. I want you to, I want you to be cheerful. I want you to understand the vision with me. Because God is able to make all grace abound towards you. He says, you're not going to run out. And if you run out, the church is going to support you. In other words, you're not going to run out. For the administration of this service not only supplies the need of the saints, but is abundant also by the many thanksgiving unto God. You know, sometimes when a missionary goes to a new area, he has to quit his job, plants his, pluck up his family, go to a new area, Usually in other countries, buying a car is expensive, renting a nice place is expensive, and hiring a building is expensive. There's no way he can do that. But the church can do that. The church can all team together, and people from several churches, maybe even several hundred churches, can pool their resources, just 25 bucks here, 50 bucks there a month, and this guy can go and deliver the gospel free of charge. Amen? How exciting is that? It really is good. God loves his church. It's the body of Christ. Paul was persecuting the church until one day he was approached, literally attacked, on the road to Damascus. And I don't have that verse here. But he says in Acts chapter 9. I do, don't I? No, I don't. It's gone. So... He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now he knew he was persecuting the church. He was picking on Christians. He said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. God takes his church very seriously. He loves his church. It's the body of Christ. Now, if Jesus was upset with the man who was persecuting the church, how much more will he be pleased with you if you bless his church? Amen. And not just a local church, but the national church, the global church. Cheerful givers not only meet the needs of the church, but many thanksgivings rise back up to God. And one of my favorite songs is that song that says, thank you. Thank you for giving to the Lord. You know, you're the reason why I, I'm saved. Amen. When we pick up a burden for missions or orphans or a national program, we are teaming up with people of like passions and accomplishing big things for God and man. This is what we call an offering. It's given on top of the tithe. And the fifth and final point is giving generously releases you from the worship of money. Because you know what? Money does want to be your God. He wants to be your God. He promises to take care of you. You know, if I just had more money, if I just had a lot more money, everything would be okay. Money promises to keep your spouse happy with you. Why? Because majority of arguments are about money, aren't they? Man, if I just had more money, she'd be happy and we wouldn't be arguing. Money promises to make you friends, your friends and your family proud of you. Money promises to make your problems go away. Why do you suppose all those people are very responsibly lining up in very long queues at the news agency, very responsibly, to buy lottery tickets? Because they believe if they just won $30 million, all of their problems will go away. And they'll be happy and they'll be free and they'll have luxury items and and money wants to give you gifts, big TV, big cars, nice clothes. Money is making an appeal. Even Christians can sometimes say to themselves, if I just had more money, 
I can make these problems go away. I can make these problems go away. And I'll be happier if I had more money. And we should be saying, I'll be happier if I had more God. Amen. <laughs> if I had God, I know that my problems will go away because I know that one day, no matter how good it gets or how bad it gets, I'm going to go to heaven one day. Amen. So money wants to be your God. So when you give away money, even if it's giving it to a friend who says, you know, we just need some nappy money for the kids because we're going through a tough time. When you give money away and, and, and say, listen, not, it's not alone. This is a gift. Just buy some nappies for your kid. This is from me to you. You are blaspheming the God of money. You're blaspheming the God of money. Amen. When someone has a need, give them a little money. When someone is struggling, give them a little money. Be faithful to give 10% to the church, but be generous on top of that and give to another ministry as well. I've been really happy with this church when we did our 2022 part two appeal. I said, listen, we really got to support home missions. Brothers and sisters, you rose up and we tripled our home missions offering in just one month. One month of just strategic giving. Because we, we're not really thinking about it. When you don't really think about it, you're not strategic. But we got strategic, amen? And I don't know about you, but even I renewed my my regular automated deposits to missions. I want to make sure missions always gets it. I'm not going to forget because now my bank's going to remember it for me. Amen. And I hope that you're like that too, because honest missions, especially home missions, they're doing a really incredible job. Next year, they're bringing over three missionaries to evangelists. They're bringing over three evangelists next year to, to travel amongst the churches. And we've already booked, I think, one. And uh, Brother Uvi, what's his name? Uatu, Brother Uatu, uh, or Tavita, his first name. He's here now in Australia, traveling around from Fiji. You know, so the home missions, they are just going gangbusters, doing wonderful things. People are getting the Holy Ghost. And so I am a big, big fan of home missions. I want to make sure that program keeps going with no delays, no stops, no, we wish we had money, but we'd like to do this. None of that going on. Amen. I want us all, every one of us, let's make a small contribution. We can help home missions to keep on doing that incredible work. So if you can find a ministry on top of your tithe, so you can have tithes and offerings and, and choose a ministry. Don't you can just say offering if you want to. That's cool because that way the church can spend on things we need around the house. But if you want to give a, a focused strategic offering, you can also say, listen, I want this to go to home missions or foreign missions or an orphanage. And we want to support people who have things on their hearts like mine, people who value things that I do so that we can pool our resources together and bless people. Proverbs 11.25 says, The person who blesses others will prosper, and he who satisfies others will be satisfied himself. There's this verse, I can't remember where it was, but we sang it, and an old song says, Keep on casting your bread upon the water, and one day it will come back to you. Now, you know, it doesn't even need to come back, does it? When you give the home missions, you don't need to say, okay, Lord, where was my, where's, where was my return on that? You know, you, you don't even ask that question. You're just happy they got it. You're happy they got it. You're happy they're still out there. Nothing worse than hearing a missionary has to come home and travel some churches and raise money so they can go back out again. It's always best. And this is what Alexandria does. The Pentecostals of Alexandria, they have because of the times, they always have some ridiculously huge missions offering to give the missionaries to make sure they don't need to come home. Actually, they fly them home for the weekend to because of the times to enjoy some great preaching and great fellowship. Then they give them a big cash money so they don't need to spend a year. Because sometimes they spend a year traveling from church to church saying, here's what we're doing in Fiji. Help support us. In fact, I was in Fiji when the missionary to Fiji was in America raising money. Because eventually people stop paying those commitments after a while. He has to go back and get more commitments started. But Alexandria, they say, you know what? Let's let's raise thirty thousand bucks for this missionary, thirty thousand bucks for this missionary, fifty thousand bucks because this guy lives in Tokyo, and thirty thousand bucks, you know, depending on how expensive places are. And they just send them out there, and they're keeping them on the field. And I love that. Amen. And um, and so again, I wish I could be there to be a part of that. So again, here's the the, the gift of giving. Amen. Giving generously allows you to enter into partnership with God's servants around the world. Giving generously places you in a position to receive blessings promised to the tithers. Giving generously makes it possible to store treasures in heaven. Giving generously strengthens your relationship with the Lord. 
Maybe one aspect I haven't shared about that is, you know, when you start giving to the Lord, you know, money's close to the heart. We don't know that. Maybe you haven't noticed it, but there's going to be a time where you're going to notice, why am I being funny about this? And you're going to realize that maybe money's a little bit closer to your heart than you thought it was. We think we're non-materialistic. We think we're totally balanced. But sometimes we discover, you know what? I put a little too much trust. It's not in God we trust around here. It's in gold we trust. I need to change that back to God. Amen. I need to change it back to God. Lord, I, I, this money's not going to save me. This money's not going to make a difference in my life that you can make a difference in my life. I'm going to trust in God, not the money to take care of my needs. And it will cause you to get closer to God. Amen. Because you're going to say, Lord, I, I really do trust in you. You are my shepherd. I believe that. And, and it helps you to get closer to the Lord. And giving generously helps you to be released from the worship of money. So let's all rise. Amen. We're not going to take an offering. I know that's probably what you think would conclude on a service like this. But I want us to spend a few moments just talking to the Lord. Amen. We didn't really talk about sin. We just talked about finances and strategically equipping ministries across the world and supporting the church locally. Amen. I want to rise up. I'm going to encourage you to rise up to another level. Sometimes, you know, some breakthroughs, you have to pray through to get the breakthrough. But some breakthroughs, you just have to simply wake up and say, oh, is that how it works? I didn't know. I met many people who had no idea how tithing worked or, or what it was or, or what it did. And sometimes preachers try to preach it in a way that if you give, God will give back twice. And that's not necessary. Like Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So I want to try to encourage you to rise up to another level. This is one breakthrough you can get without having to pray through to get the breakthrough. Amen. But you're going to discover that your flesh will give a little bit of flack. If this is your first time tithing next week, if it's your first time tithing, your flesh is going to say, ooh, I noticed that. <laughs> Amen. But after you do it a couple of times, you'll realize, you know what? This gives me nothing but joy. My flesh needs that ooh every once in a while. It's a little too comfortable. It's a little too trusting of this, this bank balance to make me happy. Amen. I, I always re encourage people to be responsible. Amen. We were teaching uh, some incredible financial principles. And if you ever want to access to those, I'll tell you where to find those. But I do want to encourage you to do money God's way. So I want to encourage you to make a choice and make a commitment. In fact, maybe you're tithing already. But you say, you know what? Yeah, I might be tithing, but I'm not strategically giving to any particular ministry. Maybe I can team up with a ministry. Maybe I can adopt a ministry. Search your heart. And if you can't think of anything, ask me. I can think of a few other things. For example, uh, there's a couple organizations out there. I think ACL is one of them where they will support people with free lawyers if they get persecuted for just being a Christian. Now, I love that ministry. Who knows, maybe one day we'll need that ministry. So if I do, I don't want to be a leech. Hey, I never gave to you guys. I didn't believe in you that much, but I need you now. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy who says, you know, we've been giving to you for so long because we love what you're doing. And then we have a situation. You know, I feel much better being that kind of guy. Amen. So again, if you can't think of any ministries, ask around and, uh, and, and support something else on top of the church. Amen tithes and offerings. Let's enjoy the freedom and the benefits of being cheerful, generous givings to God's kingdom. Amen. Let's give a clap to the Lord. Hallelujah.